Um, so our third session today um, is going to be about Islam in America, American Muslims in particular. So when I'm talking about Islam today, um, and I talk about immigrant Muslims, um, I'm talking about foreign-born American citizens. Because everything I'm talking about today are, is going to be focused on American citizens, uh, whether they're immigrant and, and were born foreign or they're native-born uh, Muslims. So try to keep that in mind, even if I use immigrant language. Um, we're talking all about American citizens today. Um, we also are, uh, hopefully at the Q&A at the end, we can touch on anything that I haven't touched on. So you can ask a question, um, if, even if it doesn't fit into today's topic. If there's a burning question that you have, hopefully we can get that answered for you. Um, so everything will work. Um, I have a timer now? Wow. <laughs> Uh-oh. That's, that's never good. Never good. Um, also, <laughs> thanks, Red. Um, also, you'll notice today that there's no whiteboards behind me. That's because today is, gonna, is a little different. There's no one overarching theme that I want to keep pointing you back to. Um, because we're going to be hitting on a bunch of different things, I talked to a few people and say, what do you want to know about Islam in America? And so I kind of compiled everything they gave me, tried to make it flow in some sense, but uh, we'll see how well it actually goes. So the first thing we want to talk about is who are American Muslims? Who is here? Uh, what are the demographics? And so the first slide will kind of help give us those numbers a little bit. First of all, it's really, really hard to say with any certainty how many Muslims are in America. And that's because the census doesn't ask for religious affiliation when it comes out every 10 years. So we, we do polls, and we can get our best guess. The problem with the, the range that we receive about American Muslims is that it can range from anywhere between 1.75 million and 13 million Muslims. That's a very, very big range. Um, I think it's more in the 5 to 6 million range. A lot of my friends who study Islam um, as their main area of focus put it in that 5 to 6 million range. Um, and so that's kind of what we're going to say. Most times we say it's about 1% of the American population. So it's small, but it's also one of the fastest growing religious traditions in America. And when we look at American Muslims, 20% of them are converts, 80% of them are born into the religion. We'll talk about the um, immigrant versus native-born breakdown um, in a second, but 20% are converts, and that number is rising in America also. Islam in America is one of the most racially diverse religious traditions. When Muslims are asked to self-identify what race they are, 30% self-identify as white, 23 self-identify as black, 21 self-identify as Asian, and 6% self-identify as Hispanic. And actually, Hispanic Muslims, that's rising also, mostly due to marriage. Uh, we see um, uh, Hispanics marrying Muslims and converting from Catholicism or Pentecostalism uh, into Islam. But Hispanic Islam is on the rise in America also. But when we look at this, this um, racial breakdown, we can't then, if we look at these numbers, then we can't just look at an Arab American and think Muslim. Because two-thirds of Arab Americans are actually Christian. They're not Muslim. And so we need to keep that in mind then when we're talking about Syrian refugees coming in. Salem's going to be receiving some Syrian refugees this year. Um, we need to keep that, those sort of numbers in mind because Christians, Muslims, non-religious Syrians, they're all fleeing the violence there. And that's who's going to be settling uh, across the country and in Oregon. So two-thirds of Arab Americans are actually Christian, not Muslim. But that said the majority of American Muslims are immigrants. We're born abroad. About 60% of them were born abroad. But we're talking now about a, a very wide range. There's no country that makes up even more than one-sixth of the entire immigrant Muslim population. The highest percentage is Pakistan, and they make up 14% of the American Muslim population. That's the single largest country. So we see a, a nice range of immigrants coming here. Um, we have about a fifth, about 20% of uh, American Muslims have been here four, three, four, five, six generations. So some are very, very um, settled in America. But, again, that said, we'll talk about a timeline next. That said, a good 25% of all American Muslims have come since 2000. So we're in a fourth wave of uh, Muslim immigration to America, and we'll talk about the first three waves uh, next. When we're talking, though, about immigrant Muslims, 
Pew did an interesting survey, and, and most of the numbers I'm getting are from their 2011 survey, because uh, it's the most extensive that we have. But mo- American Muslims were asked, what do you identify as first? Do you identify as Muslim first or American first? And 49%, almost 50%, said they identify as Muslim first. And a pretty equal split between foreign-born and native-born uh, American Muslims. About half of them say, I identify as Muslim first. 26, 27% say, I identify as American first. And 18% said, I identify as both at the same time. Interestingly enough, Christians were asked that exact same question. And the exact same number of Christians said that they first identify as Christian, not American. 46% of Christians say, I first identify as Christian, not American. When we take into consideration the margin of error of polls, it's equal. The same amount. So it's a pretty telling stat, actually, uh, when we think about how Americans identify when it comes to nationality and when it comes to religion. Every state in the country has at least one mosque in it, at least one prayer room. The highest, uh, the two biggest states, California and New York, might not be surprising because it's California and New York. Um, Oregon has 12 mosques in it. Uh, The most famous one probably is the Islamic Center of Portland. Um, But Corvallis has one. I know there used to be one in Salem. I don't know if it's still open or not, but there used to be one in Salem out on Portland Road. Um, So we have 12 mosques here in Oregon. But every state, Islam is is spread across uh, America. And even though American uh, Muslims are heavily immigrant-born, most of the imams, most of the pastors, most of the religious leaders of these mosques are American-born which means that Islam has become American. It's taken on its own brand, its own form. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, what that looks like, especially considering everything we've talked about the first two weeks. Um, But we see now the American mosque becoming an American entity, not a foreign entity. We don't see a whole lot of foreign involvement anymore in American mosques. With all this, with the mosques, though, keep in mind this racial diversity, A very, very small amount of mosques, the last numbers I saw were 3% of American mosques only have one racial breakdown in it. Every other mosque has at least two, three, four, many different racial categories, racial groups, attending that mosque, praying together, worshiping together. I was in two mosques over the summer, um, and it was amazing the amount of diversity uh, that that was there in Washington, D.C. We see now that that Islam in America has taken on a global look while having an American string to it. And we kind of want to talk about that a little bit today. Um, It's because it's it's a fairly interesting way of of thinking about things. We'll talk about the Sunni-Shia split in a little bit, but most American Muslims, if they identify as Sunni or Shia, they identify as Sunni, um, smaller than the global population. But we'll talk about what that means, and I'll, I'll rehash that back. Islam has a very long history in America, though. So the next slide is going to give us a brief timeline. I have a lot of dates here where I'm trying not to bog you down into too much. But we want to see that there's a nice, big, long history of Muslims in America. And it starts with um, African Muslims being kidnapped and brought to America as slaves in the 18th century. It's estimated that 20 to 30 percent of all slaves in America were actually Muslim, mostly in Georgia and South Carolina. But, um, but they were brought to America, and they practiced Islam while being a slave. As much as possible, they kept those five pillars. Of course, they couldn't do the Hajj, but they prayed five times a day. We have records of, of uh, Muslim slaves taking time out of their day and their fellow slaves making up the work for them so that they can pray. Or we have records of them pull, make, uh, making prayer rugs out of whatever scant materials they have so that they can pray. Or we have slaves who are fasting during Ramadan. Imagine being beaten and working 18 hours a day in the sun, and you're fasting because that's what God means to you. That's what Muslim slaves did. It's incredible. The primary sources we have are absolutely astounding about the way that American Muslim slaves uh, practice their faith here. So there's been a nice long history uh, of Islam. The first wave of immigrants that we saw came in 1875, mostly from Syria, but when I'm talking about the first wave of Muslim immigrants, I'm talking a few hundred people, not thousands by any means, a few hundred, mostly Syrians coming over um, to America. Then uh, after, right at the end of the First World War, so 1918, uh, we have a second wave, again, only a few hundred, not not thousands by any means, but that's our second wave of uh, immigration coming here. 
And then the 1930s, we see a third wave. And now we're getting into the thousands um, coming post or during the interwar period and then coming after the Second World War. This is when American Islam began to take on its own shape. Because in the 1930s, we, we begin this big wave. In the 1930s, the Nation of Islam, so the, the most uh, prominent black uh, Muslim group in America, uh, began. We'll try to talk about them a little bit today. But during then the, the Cold War period, at least until the Iranian Revolution in 1979, we had 100,000 Arab immigrants come to the, to the country in that 1945 and 1977 period. 70% of them were Muslim. So that's the third big wave, and that's when we had thousands and thousands of um, immigrants coming. So when we talk about immigrant families then, a lot of them are tracing themselves back to, to the uh, 70s, 60s, 50s. So we're talking second, third, or fourth probably not fourth generation, second or third generation uh, Muslims. I have up here that 1964 is actually a really important year. And that's when Cassius Clay converted and became Muhammad Ali. And this is an important day because when uh, Muslims came to America before 1964, they tended to change their name. They wanted to sound more American, and so they adapted American-sounding names in order to fit in. Actually, Jewish immigrants in the early 20th century did the exact same thing. They got rid of their Jewish-sounding names in order to fit in more into the American, um, the American mold, I guess. Um, but in 1964, when Cassius Clay converted and became Muhammad Ali, people stopped changing their names. Instead, they began taking on two names. They had an American name, and they had their Muslim name. And the way they said this is that I have a name that my grandmother knows me by, and I have a name that everyone else knows me by. But Muhammad Ali actually made that very um, uh, made that possible for American Muslims because the greatest boxer of all time, he was able to do this while having a Muslim name and gaining respect for the Muslim community um, as a whole. In the 1970s, this is when things started turning sour in the American mind um, against Islam. Not only 1979, the Tehran hostage crisis and the Iranian revolution, but in the early 1970s, in 1972, President Nixon actually began something called Operation Boulder. And this was in response to the um, Israeli athletes at the Olympics in Munich being kidnapped. But, um, but President Nixon proposed a screening process for all Arab immigrants coming in. And he sent letters to all embassies uh, telling them whether their citizens classify as Arab or not. And even Arab Americans were going through a special screening process. They were preparing for internment camps for Arab citizens. This is all happening in the early 1970s. It ended around 1975, but for a good three-year period, this is when the surveillance of American Muslims really began um, back with, with President Nixon. And then obviously things didn't help in 1979. So with the Tehran hostage crisis, we see a change then in how American Muslims saw themselves. When American Muslims came in this, in this third wave from 1945 to 1977, when they came in this third wave, a lot of them weren't planning on staying in America permanently. Their idea was to work, gain experience, gain money, and when they um, settled themselves, they could go back and improve the countries they came from. So their minds were still turned outward, still turned towards their homeland. In 1979, though, that changed. They saw the way the world was reacting. They saw the way uh, what happened in Iran. And so then they decided to stay. And we're going to make America our homeland. We're going to put down our roots. And this is where our kids and our grandkids are going to be born. And so the saying that kind of came out of this 1979 process is that my home is not where I'm born. My home is where my grandchildren will be born. And that's what they started doing in this 1979 period. Um, in the late 80s, um, the collapse of the Soviet Union, America was kind of faced with a choice. Who's going to become our new enemy now that communism is, is defeated? And we had two options. We had the Chinese and we had Muslims, Arabs. And thanks to, the, um, to Iran and some of these instances, um, really Arabs became the enemy over ch the Chinese. And this was somewhat of a conscious choice uh, on America's part. Um, so now we have a new um, enemy in the American eyes, and so now when we start getting to the beginning of the 1990s, we see the first Gulf War, um, and I think most of us uh, know the history from the 90s pretty well um, of that time period. But in 1995, this begins to show um, the way that Islam had, had changed in the American mind. 1995 was the Oklahoma City bombing, and we all know that Timothy McVeigh did the Oklahoma City bombing, who was a Christian, 
A Christian fundamentalist blew up the Oklahoma, the, the federal building in Oklahoma City. But Islam was the first suspect. That Muslims were the first ones uh, associated with the bombing and suspected of the bombing because of the first Gulf War. And so we have this somewhat long and tragic history of, of suspecting Muslims as being terrorists. Um, and so Muslim profiling began being passed um, inside uh, Congress with the first anti-terrorism laws that were passed in the 90s. Um, in the 2000s, we see um, Arabs and Muslims beginning to vote as a bloc for the first time. This is the first time that they decided to actually dive into American politics. I'm going to spend more time talking about this. But in the 2000 election, Muslims overwhelmingly voted for Bush. Um, things very quickly changed, but overwhelmingly voted for Bush. Um, and then I have up here 2006. In 2006, Keith Ellison uh, was elected to Congress. He's the first Muslim representative in Congress, uh, the highest ranking official uh, who is Muslim because there aren't any Muslims in, in the Senate, on the Supreme Court, um, in a cabinet position ever. There's never been. Uh, and so Keith Ellison was the first, um, the first congressman. He's from Minnesota, elected in 2006. Andre Carson from Indiana was elected in 2008 to join him. And so now we have two Muslim members of, of Congress. How's that for a very brief timeline? We're going to try to, we're going to, try to dive into some of these, but I want to talk about the, the main arc before we kind of uh, pick exactly what, what we're going to be focusing on. And so the first thing we're going to be focusing on is, is immigration. As I said, the, the timeline had three waves of immigration. There really have been fourth, because after uh, 2000, we see a very large influx of, of Muslim immigrants. Um, almost, like I said, almost a quarter of, um, of Muslims today uh, came in this post-2000 period. The interesting thing, uh, this, this is something you don't necessarily learn in your high school history class, um, that when, the, when Muslim immigrants first came to America, they didn't have an Arab identity marker to them. They were identified by their nation of origin. So in that first wave in the 1875, when Syrians came to America, they were known as Syrians. They weren't known as Arab. And that continued actually until the mid-1900s. And in the mid-1900s, right around that 1950 period, that's when Israel became a nation. And part of the national discourse was to construct Israel as being up against the entire world. And so in this post-Israeli period, in the 1950s and on, that's when Arab as a category in the American imagination was really assigned to Muslims. Because it was, not, it was too difficult to say it's Israel against Lebanon, and it's Israel against Syria, and it's Israel against whoever. It's easier to say it's Israel against all Arabs. And that is able to construct a much different narrative than having it as a country versus country type battle. So we see then when the first uh, immigrants came to America, they had to fight a little bit of a different battle. Again, something that we don't see, teach in our history classes, but uh, America has a very long history of only wanting whites to uh, immigrate to this country. This started in 1790. We're going back long ways. In 1790, the Naturalization Act was passed where only free whites could become citizens. And that was the law uh, for uh, until really until 1964, uh, when the Civil Rights Act was passed. We see a couple differences or a couple changes. In 1882, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act, where we banned any Chinese immigrants uh, from becoming uh, citizens in America. In 1906, we have another immigration act called the Naturalization Act of 1906, where we said that only whites and persons of African descent could become natural citizens. So now with this law being controlled, 1906, that's when the second and third wave of, um, of Muslim immigrants had to assert themselves. So when they actually went to court to argue that they were white, they had to prove their whiteness in order to gain citizenship. And then we have Supreme Court decisions and federal cases, uh, Arabs arguing that they're white. The first Arab immigrants were successful mainly because a lot of them were Christian. And so they were able to argue on behalf of their Christianity that they were white. And that set a precedent then for most Arabs to be seen as white in the early 20th century. So the major Supreme Court, or it's not a Supreme Court, it's a federal court case, a District of Appeals, um, Dow versus U.S. He was a Syrian immigrant 
um, who argued that he was white and therefore he could be a citizen. Because if he wasn't white, then they wouldn't allow him to be a citizen. And the judge said then that inhabitants of a portion of Asia, not all Asia, a portion of Asia are to be classified as white people. So then they become citizens. Well, a few months later, a Japanese immigrant tried to argue that he was white, and the judge said, no, we all know Japanese people aren't white. A Sikh immigrant from India tried the next year, and the judge again said, no, you're not white. So Arabs were actually able to argue for whiteness in order to become citizens. And, be, and they did this largely because um, mo- many of the Arab immigrants were Christian. This drew, drove the narrative in American imagination for a long time. That Arab, in the early 20th century, Arab equaled Christian in the American mind. And that didn't change, again, until about 1979, that Ira- uh, the Iranian Revolution. It did a lot for the American ma- imagination. Um, but it, it's really, it, it makes us think about some of the battles that uh, Arab immigrants and Muslim immigrants have had to fight here um, in order to become citizens. So then, before Arab equaled Christian, Post uh, 1980, 1979, um, Arab equaled Muslim. This is when I try to make a really artificial flow with my next thing, okay? Because when the immigrants then came to America, a lot of times they brought their, uh, their religious faith with them and their particular denomination of Islam. So I know a lot of you are wondering, what's this big deal about Sunni and Shia Islam? And so this is when we're going to talk about that. Because the early immigrants tended to bring this with them. We see that now a a big change in in Islam today, and we'll talk about that. But we need to say, first of all, before we talk about what Sunni and Shia Islam are, it's it's a lie that Sunni and Shia Muslims have always been at, at odds with each other. It's a lie that they've always been fighting each other. We have plenty of instances of Sunni and Shiites uh, living together, marrying together, you know, living side by side. Um, and so we can't say that it's always been a clash between the two. Um, again, a lot of the modern tension is dating back to 1979 when the Ayatollah took over in Iran. It also needs to be said that both Sunni and Shia as large movements are against ISIS. And that's because uh, the supreme leader of ISIS is trying to take over both the Sunni and the Shia branches, trying to supersede them. Uh, In one way, he says um, that he is an elected caliph, and so he says he's going to fit into the Sunni branch because he's an elected leader, while to satisfy the Shiites, he's going to say that he's actually in the bloodline of Muhammad. So he's trying to compete for authority in these two branches of Islam. Both branches overwhelmingly reject ISIS. But when we talk about the two major branches of Islam, we have Sunni and Shia. Sunni is by far the world's largest branch. Somewhere between 85 and 90% of all Muslims in the world are Sunni. And the way this branch uh, happened, this split happened, is after Muhammad the prophet died, there was a conversation, a debate about who was going to take over for him. Because according to most Muslims, Muhammad didn't actually designate a single successor. So they didn't know who was supposed to take over for him. So the split then happened in who we're going to back. Sunnis, um, they say that we're going to follow the father-in-law of Muhammad. He was a close friend and a close advisor. But we're going to elect him as caliph. And a caliph, in this sense, is an elected official who is going to lead all of Islam. And for them, it's Sunni Islam. So they follow very much, Sunni comes from Sunnah, which means tradition. So they want to follow the way that Islam has been practiced for a long time, but not in the sense of old and rigid and and unmoving. Sunni Muslims, they're focused on the community. They're focused on the ummah. So when I said in our Quranic interpretation from the first session, when I said that most Muslims, when they interpret the Quran, they take into account the consensus of the community, the consensus of all 1.6 billion Muslims, that's only half true. Oh, it's really 90% true. Because that's what, that's what Sunni Islam does. They want to take into account the consensus of all the scholars. Because the way that they think about it is that Abu Bakr, Muhammad's father-in-law, he could take over. But there's only one religious leader, and that's Muhammad. So the caliph then, he's going to be in charge of politics and society, but not in charge of religion. The people who are supposed to translate the Quran is all of us, the community, the ummah, because we don't have another prophet. So because Muhammad tried to set up a society that made it easy to submit to God, 
the caliph is in charge of making sure that runs. But most authority then is going to be left to the, to the Sunnah, or to the Ummah, excuse me, to the Muslim community, especially when it comes to religious authority. They also say, Sunni Islam also says that religion should be uh, structured, it should be well-governed, and it should be an everyday thing, not a Sunday thing, not a, uh, not a part-time thing. Religion should be a constant thing in our lives because that's how Muhammad set it up. And again, he's going to be our main uh, focus when it comes to religious authority. So majority of Muslims say religious authority is left up to the community as a whole. This is where Shiites differ. Very strongly do Shiites differ. So can you hit the next slide for me, Dave? Shiites make up the other 10 to 15% of American Muslims. There are other branches of Islam, uh, especially mystic Islam called Sufism, but um, Shiites make up about the other 10 to 15%. They're very small globally. Shia Islam is really found in um, Iran and Pakistan and India um, and parts of Iraq. But they follow a guy named Ali, who is Muhammad's son-in-law and his cousin. Because in their mind, the prophet continues a, a lineage, a bloodline. And actually, they'll look back to the Hebrew Bible, to the Old Testament, and see how often kingships or prophethood was passed through a lineage, through the bloodline. And so they say, no, we only have one prophet. We have Muhammad, but his bloodline is special. And so our leader should be a descendant of Muhammad. They'll also say that in the uh, weeks before Muhammad's death, he designated Ali as a successor. It wasn't public, so not everyone knew about it. But in a private ceremony, he said that Ali was going to take over and lead. And so it's actually Muhammad's wish that his son-in-law was going to take over. Most Islam disagrees with that, but one of the main splits is that when, um, so Sunni Islam has the caliph that they elect. Ali became the fourth caliph. He eventually became elected, but then he was assassinated and his son was assassinated also. And so that caused a major split. Every year now, the the, uh, anniversary of his assassination is commemorated as a holiday because that's when we see the first major, major split. Because they're following in the bloodline of Muhammad as much as possible, their leader, and they're going to, it's going to be a capital I imam, not the imam that we see as a pastor in a mosque, but a capital I imam, um, he's going to have social and political authority, but also religious authority, because Muhammad had religious authority. So now, basically, we want to keep it in the family. That's where the main difference is. Where do we get our religious authority? Do we get it from one single figure? Or do we get it from the consensus of the entire community, of all 1.6 billion of us? For most Shiites, they don't have a living imam today. They followed a line of 12, and so they're called the Twelvers. But they follow a line of 12 today, and in 873, the 12th imam went into hiding so that he wouldn't be killed. And they say that he's still on earth today, in hiding, and that he's going to come back at the end of the world and lead Armageddon. That, that he's still around, and so they don't need another capital I imam. There are smaller groups of Shiites uh, who follow an imam today, uh, and they're on their 49th imam, if I remember correctly. So they have a, a one single religious leader. Because most Shiites are following this 12th imam, who isn't visible to us or isn't out in the public, this is where people like the Ayatollah come into play. Because the Ayatollah... Um, in Iran has political, social, and religious authority. There are multiple ayatollahs across the world, um, but the one in Iran has religious, political, and social authority. So he's kind of seen as one of the main leaders. But that's where we see the major break. Who was supposed to take over after Muhammad, and where do we get our religious authority from? Most American Muslims follow Sunni Islam. Most of the world follows Sunni Islam. But if we see this 85 to 90 percent split in global Islam, we actually don't see that in America. So in America, we have a smaller uh, global population that 65 percent of American Muslims identify as Sunni and 11. So that kind of hits the um, the global number. 11 percent of American Muslims identify as, as Shiite. What we see on the rise, though, is that a good 15 percent of American Muslims say, I'm just Muslim. I'm not Sunni or Shiite. And this tells us something. This tells us, and this is especially true among American-born Muslims. This tells us that Islam in America is taking on its own form. 
It's not relying on the global community to tell it what to do. But Islam in America is becoming, in some ways, its own branch of Islam, which takes on American values, which takes on the way that we practice religion in this country. They're not relying on the rest of the world to tell them what to do or how to practice. They're just Muslim. They don't fit into this break that we see uh, pretty strongly in the rest of the world. This is also what, uh, the, the recent controversy with what is it, Saudi Arabia and Iran, when Saudi Arabia executed one of the top leading uh, Iranian clerics. Uh, th that's the Sunni-Shia split coming into a political realm here. Um, if any of you paid attention to the news three weeks ago or whenever that was. So, um, so most Muslims, American Muslims are Sunni, but we, we see this rise in saying that they just are Muslim, just period. When we look at American practice, Again, if we look at the way that American Muslims identify, first as Muslim and second as American, that mirrors Christianity. And the numbers suggest that Muslim practice in America also mirrors Christianity. In the sense that we have about 47%, about half of Muslims, attend the mosque weekly or more than weekly. That's the same for Protestant Christianity, or Christianity as a whole. If we, if we take out evangelicalism, evangelicalism, uh, that number's up in the 64, 65%. But Christianity as a whole in America says about the exact same. 45% of, of Christians say they attend church weekly or more than weekly. If we look at how American Muslims view religion, 69% of American Muslims say that religion is very important to them, which matches exactly to the 70% of American Christians who say the exact same thing. About half of all Muslims pray five times a day, which again means that half of Muslims are finding their own way. They're finding their own way to practice Islam in an American culture. Um, I should also say these are, these are really fascinating stats because when we see uh, the attendance at the mosque or we look at American women, uh, Muslim women wearing the hijab, all of these numbers tend to be higher among American-born Muslims, not foreign-born Muslims. Let me say that again. More American-born Muslims attend a mosque more frequently than foreign-born Muslims. It shows that when, American, uh, when Americans convert to Islam or they're born here, they increase their religious piety. And this, again, it mirrors Judaism. Because when Jewish immigrants first came to America, uh, the, the, one of the major waves in the early 1900s, the early 20th century, they began to see America as a place where they could experiment and a place that they could finally be free of religious burden. So Jews then, they came and, and said, I don't have to attend synagogue. I don't have to eat kosher. I don't have to wear a kippah because that's not what Americans do. So immigrants are saying the same thing when they're Muslim, by and large. But now that we're settled for a second or third generation, our Americanness doesn't tend to be questioned. So now we divert ourselves a little bit more uh, strongly to our religious faith. So second and third generation American Muslims, they tend to be more devout in their faith than first generation American Muslim immigrants. It's really a fascinating thing. Um, and they're trying to recover like their past in some ways. Um, but it's, it's a pretty fascinating thing. 40% of American Muslim women never wear the hijab. 36% wear it all the time. That means the other however many percent, 20-ish um, percent, um, wear it sometimes. It's a really bad idea to try to look and gauge someone's religiosity by what they wear. But since everyone talks about the hijab, uh, I wanted to put that number up there. When we see then um, this idea of American Muslims making America their home, and making Islam, giving Islam its own American branch. We see that with different Muslim groups that have begun in America, the most famous of which is Nation of Islam. Nation of Islam began in the 1930s, predominantly black Islam, and they arose um, in response to um, racial tensions inside America in the 20th century. That Christians for so long said, blacks, you can't worship in our churches. The famous saying that 10 a.m. Sunday morning was the most segregated hour in America because they set up separate churches. So blacks tried to say that Islam is our native religion because it's the religion from Africa. That's what our ancestors worshipped, and we know that we belong in the religion of our ancestors. So Nation of Islam began as a place of belonging for American, uh, black Americans because Christianity didn't accept them. 
So then when, um, when we talk about the civil rights movement, we have Malcolm X and uh, Martin Luther King Jr., kind of the two uh, main figures of this movement. Martin Luther King arguing from a Christian perspective, Malcolm X arguing from an, a Muslim perspective, that because Islam teaches unity, because Islam teaches that we're all one community, because one God means one people, America just needs to convert to Islam and we won't have a racial problem. That was his belief. And he, he believed that especially after he went to the Hajj. He went to Mecca and worshiped with millions of other Muslims from across the world without any tension. He realized what Islam could do for the race uh, crisis in America. And Nation of Islam is still saying that today. They're still talking about the racial tensions of this country. They're on the ground in Ferguson and in Baltimore and in the Carolinas. They're trying to argue the exact same thing. Now from a very American perspective, but we see that America is a place for Islam to become its own branch or for new movements of Islam uh, to emerge. If America is becoming its own thing, it means then that it's really hard to talk about Sharia law and apply it to all American Muslims. But if you ever listen to the news, especially a few years ago, that's what politicians and talking heads are trying to do. So let's talk about what Sharia law is. Sharia, first of all, it means a street, or not a street, it means street or path. It's a guidance. Remember the, the whiteboards from the first session. The problem in the world is self-sufficiency and idolatry, and the solution is peace and surrender. That's what Islam means, the peace that we receive when we surrender to God. So Sharia, then, is the pathway to get to that. It's the path that we take to surrender to God. And the way that it's set up, most times it's talked about that it's the idealized path. It's the way that we ought to practice. If you listen to politicians talking, though, you'll hear that Sharia law is taking over America as if it's a one singular thing. And this was especially true back in 2011, 2012. From those two years, from 2011 to 2012, 73 different bills were introduced in 31 states trying to ban Sharia law from becoming law in America. Not that a single American Muslim was talking about it. Not that there's ever a bill being debated to enact Sharia law, whatever that would be in these states. But 31 states preemptively tried to ban foreign law or Sharia law explicitly as taking over. But remember what I said in the first week. Sharia law is not a set thing. There's no book of Sharia law. It's debated. It's argued. If it's up to the community, that means the community is going to disagree with each other on what the best path is to take to God. But we know that Sharia is the path that we should take to God. Also, before I dive into what Sharia law actually is, um, it should be said that Sharia law is only binding on Muslims. It's not binding on non-Muslims. So American Muslims, it would be, it'd be ludicrous to try to enact it in America because it's only supposed to be binding on, uh, on Muslims. It would be like trying to say that Jews are trying to enact halakha, Jewish law, on all non-Jews. Halakha is only binding on Jews. That's what makes them Jewish. Okay? And so Sharia law, is the, we need to think about it in a very, very similar way. But because this is path or guidance, it's very subjective and it changes over time. One scholar says that Sharia law, it's tangible enough for everyday use but still flexible enough to accommodate evolution and personal choice. And that's really what it should be. And that's really how American Muslims see it today. If you want to break up Sharia law into two things, we can say it's two things. One, religious observance. How do we get to God through our religious practice? And it's a civil. How do we create a society that makes it easy to submit to God? The religious side of things is what we talked about in the first session. The five pillars. Prayer, fasting, the Hajj, charity, all these things are part of, our, of, part of Sharia. Sharia law tells us, tell Muslims that they can't drink or do tobacco. They can't gamble. They tell them that they can only eat certain foods, just like kosher law in Judaism. In fact, the dietary standards for Islam are remarkably similar to the dietary laws in Judaism. It's called halal. Halal means permissible. So you can't eat pork just like in Judaism. You can't eat an animal that's been gored to death by another animal, just like in Judaism. You can't eat food that's been sacrificed, just like in Judaism. All of these are part of Sharia law. 
Sharia law tells you not to rip off your neighbor, to be an honest business person, to be kind and charitable, to help the people in need. That's all Sharia law. When Muhammad was in 7th century Arabia in Medina and set up his, his society, part of Sharia law was expanding the rights of women. So before, in 7th century Arabia, only the firstborn male could receive an inheritance. Under Sharia law, all descendants receive an inheritance, including women. They receive less than men, but in 7th century Arabia, women weren't responsible for making all the money for the family. We also see that women had rights in 7th century Arabia. Uh, Sharia law gave them the ability to initiate a divorce. Again, unheard of in that time period. So what we do hear, though, in the news are some of the criminal codes that are associated with Sharia law. And it's true that there are criminal codes talked about in the Quran, and there are criminal codes talked about in, Muslim, in Islamic law as a whole. What gets the attention of us is the stonings or the hangings or uh, things like that. I'm not talking about ISIS beheadings. Okay? I'm talking about what happens when Saudi Arabia decides to stone someone to death as a legal form of punishment. And yes, stoning is an acceptable form of the death penalty in several countries. But what you don't hear on the news is that that's incredibly rare. That's why it makes the news. Because it doesn't happen in most Muslim countries. Most Muslims don't interpret the Quran in that same way anymore. They don't stone people to death. But if we want to keep in mind what the goal of this was in 7th century Arabia, it's to create a society that makes it easy to submit to God. So now we want to deter crime as much as possible. So you're not going to steal if it's going to cost you your hand. Because stealing is teaching you that you're dependent upon yourself for sustenance, not that you're dependent upon God. It fits into that first sin of self-sufficiency or unbelief. There's a purpose behind it. But interpreting Sharia law as a criminal code is very rare across, um, across the world. Most Muslim countries don't do it. Is it a problem that we still see stonings for adultery and stuff like that in the world? Yes, absolutely. I'm not saying anything else. But this isn't a mainstream Muslim thing. And most Muslims across the world, well, they're not empowered to actually enact death penalties anyway. But Muslims are fighting against it. Muslim feminists are speaking very, very loudly against some of these things. And so it's important to recognize those voices when we talk about what Sharia law is. When we then look at how American Muslims look at Sharia law, most Muslims see it, American Muslims, see it as a personal thing, not a public thing. Which means that they're going to look at number one, the religious observance, and they're going to say that's what Sharia is. It's going to govern what my family does. It's going to govern what ethics and morals I give my children. It's going to govern whether or not I can take 15 minutes out of my busy day and remember God by praying. It's a personal thing. This country has the Constitution. This country has a First Amendment. We don't need to enact Sharia law here. In fact, that's why we immigrated here, because we like America's laws. We don't need to change them. So most American Muslims see it as a personal thing. And when we look at a few tangential questions, uh, we can kind of get to how American Muslims see uh, Sharia law in a little different way. That 57% of American Muslims say that there's more than one way to interpret the Quran. And just like when we talk about religious observance, more native-borns um, are, are more religiously devout, we see a flip in what we might imagine, that more foreign-born American citizens say that there's more than one way to interpret the Quran and Islam than native-born American Muslims. About the same amount um, that 57-ish percent say that there's more than one way to make it to eternal life, not just Islam. And again, that number is higher among, among foreign-born American Muslims than native-born American Muslims. The majority of, of mosque leaders say that they will take into consideration a flexible interpretation of the Quran when they're preaching. And we do see that more among American-born Muslims because they're, they're taking uh, more imams are American-born than foreign-born now. But there's absolutely no evidence that any American Muslims or a vast majority of American Muslims want some sort of Sharia law to uh, take the place of the Constitution. There's one uh, survey that was done of 212 imams and lawyers and uh, legal scholars, Muslim legal scholars mostly. And zero 
Zero of those 212, yes, it's a small sample size, but they're looking at not just everyday Muslims, but Muslim leaders. Zero of the 212 said that American courts should apply Islamic law to Muslims or non-Muslims. And when they and when they asked about particular family tribunals, should we set up uh, special Muslim family tribunals for your Muslim family to take your religious concerns to? Only three of them said that they were in favor of that. Most American Muslims see um, is or Sharia as a personal thing. And let me say, this is actually different than Orthodox Jews, because in this country, we have religious courts set up for Orthodox Jews for them to, uh, to decide their disputes without going to American civil or district or federal courts. We have Orthodox Jewish courts set up in New York that are legally binding. So we already allow for this in the American religious context. But American Muslims don't want it. And that's what all the survey suggests. Most American Muslims see Sharia as a personal thing. Um, I have no idea how to make this connection to the next thing. Okay, so Sharia law is its own thing. Um, we don't, American Muslims don't overwhelmingly want it applied, uh, and they see it as a personal thing. What's also asked about American Muslims, not only, here's the connection, what's also asked about American Muslims, not only do you want Sharia applied, and you hear that, but you hear that American Muslims aren't condemning terrorism. Or you hear that, why aren't American or Muslims in general across the world speaking out against terrorism? And first of all, we have to say that that's a wrong question. Because when have we ever asked Christians to apologize for Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing? When do we ever ask entire religions, especially our own religion, to apologize for a small group? Yes, we see Christians speaking up against Westboro Baptist. But are Christians asked to apologize for Westboro Baptist? When it comes to our religion, we tend to recognize that the extremists are extreme, and they don't represent our particular religious affiliation. It's about time that we do the same thing for Islam. Instead of trying to hold all the Muslims accountable for ISIS and Al-Qaeda, maybe we should hold ourselves accountable for the extremists doing, doing uh, harm in Christianity's name. And in case you don't think that Christianity is causing any problems in the world, wake up. When the Pope went to Africa, there were Christian terrorists trying to assassinate the Pope. This was two months ago. It was the largest security detail that the Pope has ever traveled with because Christians were trying to kill him. Christianity has its own problems, and we don't ask Christians to apologize for the sins of the extremists. We shouldn't ask Muslims to do the same thing because it's already starting from the viewpoint that Islam is to blame in some sense rather than extremism is to blame. But that said, let's look at some of the condemnations. One of the most famous uh, American groups, uh, they're called CARE, the Council for American Islamic Relations. From 1994 to 2015, they have put out over 100 condemnations of terrorism uh, and condemnations against persecution against Christians. They have, in fact, named terrorist organizations by name, saying that this is not done in the name of Islam. I mentioned this uh, last week, but in September of 2014, an open letter, a 28-page letter, was written and signed by over 100 Islamic scholars. All over the world signed it, and more have added their names since then. And in this 28-page fatwa, they told ISIS in Arabic, using the Quran and using the teachings of the Muhammad, that ISIS is un-Islamic. And again, over 100 scholars from all across the world signed it, recognizing that there's this condemnation. In 2010, uh, a Pakistani politician, Islamic scholar, wrote a 600-page fatwa using the Quran and using the example of the Prophet, denouncing terrorism. And he denounced terrorism in all its forms. But the famous quote he said is that terrorism is terrorism, violence is violence, and it has no place in Islamic teaching, and no justification can be provided for it, or any kind of excuses or ifs or buts. 600, how many of you have written a 600-page paper in your life? A 600-page fatwa denouncing a Pakistani scholar and politician. ISIS um, announced their worldwide caliphate in June of 2014. And I can't go back and look at all the condemnations that have happened since 2001, so I said, let's look at all the condemnations that have happened in, uh, since ISIS announced their worldwide caliphate. I stopped, they announced it in June, I stopped looking after July and August, because I think this is a pretty good sampling. 
the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which represents most Muslims, a good 1.4 billion Muslims in 57 countries, in July of 2014, so a month after ISIS, said ISIS has nothing to do with Islam and condemns the persecution of Christians and other religious minorities across the world and especially in Iraq. The Grand Mufti Shakwi Alam, the highest religious authority in Egypt, denounced ISIS as a threat to Islam and said that they violate both Sharia law and humanitarian law. The Arab League, which is kind of like the United Nations for uh, Islamic countries, the Arab League represents 22 nations. They denounce crimes against humanity committed by ISIS against civilians, Christians, and other religious minorities. The highest-ranking cleric in Turkey denounced the attempt to establish a caliphate and condemned death threats against Christians by ISIS in July. CARE, that organization, issued three separate ones between July 7th and August 20th. The Muslim Council of Great Britain in July, Islamic Society of North America in August. Um, Saudi Arabia's top religious cleric said terrorists like ISIS is the number one enemy to Islam. The Muslim Public Affairs Council in August of 2014 denounced ISIS. That's just in two months. The sad thing is, is that American media doesn't report this. You will read this in Al Jazeera, and even Al Jazeera America, sadly they're being shut down. But you'll read it in Al Jazeera America, you won't see it necessarily on Fox or CNN or MSNBC or HuffPo or New York Times or anything like that. It's not sexy enough to make the news. And that's too bad, because Muslims are overwhelmingly condemning terrorism, and they're doing it very loudly. Right after Paris, Muslims were very quick on the news denouncing it, saying this is not uh, Islamic at all. That's how American Muslims feel about terrorism. American Muslims are also getting involved in our country. A lot of times when immigrants came to America, they didn't know where they fit into the American mold. And it's because a lot of foreign-born American Muslims were originally planning on leaving and going back to their country, they didn't invest themselves in the early 1900s and mid-1900s in American politics. And we see this in a few ways. One, that they weren't planning on staying. Two, they didn't know where they belonged. But three, a lot of these people came from countries where it was dangerous to get involved in politics. So they, weren't, they didn't have a political mindset in order to get involved in the first place. A fourth major reason is that, by and large, in Muslim thinking, running for office is arrogant. It's egotistical. And if we think about the number one problem in the world, self-sufficiency, that's what running for office does. In, an American, or in a Muslim mind, you're asked to serve. You're asked to run. You don't put yourself forward because that's egotistical. So they couldn't think about running for office because it wasn't really in their mindset. Also, Muslims in America are diverse. There's no one single block. Immigrant Muslims have a much different experience than black Muslims have a much different experience than white Muslims. And so there's no unified block to get all Muslims together to do anything anyway. This began to change in 2000, when American Muslims, they by and large have decided that they're going to stay, that America is their home, they put down their roots, they decided this is where their grandchildren are going to be born. And so in 2000, we begin to see the first um, uh, Muslim block of voters, I should say. And again, there's diversity uh, among them. But the, in 2000, this was mostly led by Arab Christians, trying to get all Muslims together and all Arabs together voting as one. So in 2000, Muslims overwhelmingly voted for Bush. This is because the Bush campaign actually reached out to Arabs and talked to them about their issues, again, led by Arab Christians, but Bush actually tried to campaign to Arabs and to Muslims. He promised that all the anti-Muslim um, uh, laws and uh, surveillance put in place in the, in the 90s, would, he would get away with that. No more profiling of Muslims. So Muslims overwhelmingly voted for Bush in 2000. After 9-11, President Bush did a very good job of saying that this country is not at war with Islam, it's at war with Al-Qaeda or the Taliban or these small extremists. He, did, he stood inside Islamic centers and said this. He was very, very strong about saying Islam is not the enemy. The problem in American Muslims' mind happened after that, that the Patriot Act was enacted, and not only was the Patriot Act enacted, but we went into Iraq. And for American Muslims, both of those were complete no-goes. That the Patriot Act, no matter all the promises that Bush made, uh, he broke those promises in their mind by enacting the Patriot Act. So in the 2004 election, Muslims tended to overwhelmingly vote for Kerry, but they didn't 
really campaign for him. They weren't very excited about Kerry. For American Muslims, it was kind of the lesser of two evils in their mind. They weren't huge fans of Kerry. 2008, though, is when American Muslims began voting very heavily again. But the 2008 election, it impacted American Muslims. So all the accusations of Obama being a Muslim and therefore being foreign and therefore not being an American citizen, that affected American Muslims. Because by proxy, they're being told they don't belong. They're being told they're foreign. They're being told that their Americanness is being questioned, even if they've been here for four generations. So the accusations leveled against Obama actually affected American Muslims uh, quite heavily. They also tended to see McCain as uh, a second Bush. And so we see then Obama carried the votes uh, pretty heavily uh, in 2008. And again, in 2012, Obama carried the vote. That's because Mitt Romney didn't really campaign uh, for Muslims. He didn't ask them about their issues. He didn't uh, try to reach out to those voters. But in 2012, Muslims weren't very excited about Obama either because they said that his foreign policy wasn't much better than Bush. He's, they said that Guantanamo was still open. They said the drone strikes were killing Muslim civilians. He's, they said the Patriot Act is still happening. We're still being wiretapped. And so they weren't super excited about Obama in 2012, but they tended to vote for him because Romney didn't even make an effort. This is to say that most American Muslims are registered Democrat, but the, their vote is actually up for grabs. And if you listen to the political talk today, maybe it's not so much up for grabs. Obviously, they're not going to vote for Donald Trump, who's talking about registering them and putting them in internment camps. But it means that American Muslims still don't know necessarily where they fit on the American political landscape. American Muslims tend to be big government social conservatives, which means they straddle both parties pretty well. They like foreign aid, they like welfare, but they tend to side with Republicans when it comes to social issues. They don't know where they fit. And so they're an open block for voting. In 2006, as I said, Keith Ellison was elected as our first Muslim representative. Um, I met with him over the summer. He's an awesome, awesome guy. And he swore in on the Quran, on Thomas Jefferson's Quran, when he took his oath of office. It was an incredible thing. Um, and when he, but the show part of the problem, when he was, uh, after he was elected, uh, he was interviewed on CNN. This is when uh, Glenn Beck was on CNN. And Glenn Beck asked him, how do we know you're not working for the enemy? Keith Ellison has worked very hard since his election in 2006 to talk about how American he actually is, to talk about how American Muslims have been supporting this country. Um, he's, he's very, very vocal on, in Congress. There was a special election in 2008 to fill a vacant seat uh, in Indiana, and Andre Carson joined him as the second Muslim representative. He's still in Congress now today also. I think what should be noted is that both Keith Ellison and Andre Carson are black Muslims. And they have what we call, might call American-sounding names. We have still not elected anyone who has a Muslim-sounding name to federal office. We don't have a governor across the country that's elected with that name. Because that Muslim-sounding name still strike fear in the hearts of most Americans. They, they sound to most Americans as being foreign, as not belonging. And so Keith Ellison and Andre Carson have done a great job of kind of breaking that barrier but there's still a lot of work left to be done. Let's just say that. So the last thing I want to talk about, because um, this hour went a lot faster than I expected. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is Muslim community service um, across uh, the country. So Muslims are getting involved in their communities, especially if they start seeing America as their homeland of where they want their grandchildren to raise up, uh, be born. They are investing themselves. So again, if we just look at recent things, I, can, I don't have time to go back and do everything for the past 15 years. If we look at just recent things, I hope you all have heard about the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. There's been a, uh, an organization called Who is Hussein that just three days ago, four days ago, donated 30,000 bottles of water to the Red Cross designated for Flint. And this organization, Who is Hussein, uh, their global focus is providing clean drinking water to people. Over the summer this year, there was, a there was a major string of arson attacks against black churches in the South. Dozens of black churches were burned. And this all happened after the Charleston shooting of the AME church. And there was a Muslim student uh, who decided to raise money to help rebuild those black churches. And so she raised over $100,000 in order to help rebuild black churches in the South. After the San Bernardino attack, 
the San Bernardino Mosque hosted a blood drive. And they're part of this organization called Muslims for Life. That this organization, since 2011 until now, they host an event every year. And from 2011 to now, they have raised over 40,000. Uh, you don't raise blood, you, you collect blood. So they have collected over 40,000 units of blood just doing once a year blood drives. They started this on September 11, 2011, on the 10 year anniversary. We have Islamic American Sakat organizations. So where do Muslims donate their money? We have Sakat organizations that are focused both on uh, Americans and uh, people abroad, but they focus their help not just on Muslims, but on anyone who needs help. They help non-Muslims also. One of the organizations, the Sakat Foundation of America, um, they take their, one of their mottos is from the Quran itself, uh, chapter 76, verses 8 and 9, they feed with food despite their own desire for it. The indignant and the orphan and the captive, they feed them, saying, we feed you purely for the sake of God. We desire no reward from you nor thankfulness. That's their motto. That's their, their driving organization. Interestingly enough, um, we've seen a change since 2001 in Sakat giving and, um, and community service because the Patriot Act decided to place a bunch of suspicion on any Muslim trying to donate to foreign Muslim aid organizations because they're all being investigated for ties to terror organizations. And so there, I have lists of several Muslim-based nonprofits across the world that have been shut down by the U.S. government for supposedly supporting terrorism. I should say that no non-Muslim aid organization has ever been shut down for supporting terrorism, only Muslim ones, and including two here in Oregon, I should say. But what I will say is that American Muslims said, well, if we can't turn our money abroad and help people across the world, we'll turn our Sakat money domestic. So they've begun new aid organizations. They began to turn their aid money to America and help Americans with their charity, with their tithing. So that's kind of the unintended consequence of the Patriot Act, that now they're turning all their stuff inward, which means we also see uh, a lot of new mosques being built in America uh, post-2001 because the money is not going abroad anymore. It's, it's staying here. The thing I'll end on is Muslims involved in interfaith organizations. Um, the most, probably the most visible one and one of the most important ones is being built right now in Omaha, Nebraska. It's called the Tri-Faith Initiative. And a synagogue, a church, and a mosque um, uh, bought a 35-acre plot of land, and they all three are going to be building on it. So the synagogue was built in October of, of 2013, and the mosque is being built now. Um, a United Church of Christ will be built after the mosque, and they're sharing this 35-acre parcel of land in Omaha called the Tri-Faith Initiative. In Fremont, California, we have a Methodist church and a mosque sharing parking lots and landscaping and outdoor lighting. So they're not necessarily on the same part of land, but they're neighbors with the same parking lot. So a lot of their interfaith dialogue has to do with normal landscaping and maintenance stuff, but allows them to get to know each other. That's in Fremont, California. That was built in, uh, in 1993. The Sacramento Salam Center, Salam means peace in Islam. So the Sacramento Salam Center in 2012, they hosted two Easter services in their mosque because the church, um, they lost their lease for their building so they couldn't use it. And so the, the mosque in Sacramento said, you can host your two Easter services here uh, in, our, in our mosque. The Chabad of East Bronx, Chabad is a conservative branch of Judaism. The Chabad of East Bronx, same thing happened to them. They lost their lease. And so they worship temporarily inside a mosque in, in New York. This isn't just Muslims helping uh, Christians or Jews. A Presbyterian church in Florida back in 2012, for over a year, they let Muslims hold their prayer services, uh, their Juma, their Friday afternoon prayer, uh, in their church while their mosque was being built. So we see this going both ways uh, in this country. And again, I wish that stuff would make the news, but you have to go find it or know where to look for it, and that's tragic. Um, but because of time, I could go over a lot more examples, but I'm already 10 minutes over. <laughs> so sorry about that. <laughs> but like always, I'll, whoa, that sounded louder. Um, but like always, I want to um, open it up for questions. Um, about this or about something that we haven't talked about that's burning on your mind. So please raise your hand. We have one over here and in the back. I 
I heard numerous um, news reports during the Paris incident and other things that have happened that the reason that um, young people are drawn to uh, ISIS and uh, Al Qaeda is because they can't find jobs. And do you think if there were programs to help youth that that would actually help, or is it just an excuse? No, that's that's true. Uh, more for foreign-born people than American-born people. Uh, so for foreign-born people, ISIS is paying salaries to their fighters, um, and so it is seen. We have we see um, high unemployment rates among youth in a lot of countries in the Middle East, and so that is a draw for them. For Americans going over, it tends to be uh, isolationism that is the driving factor for American Muslims going over to to fight with ISIS, not employment reasons. But for for uh, the Middle East area, employment is a big one, actually. Yeah. Then why are not those countries stepping up to have programs for the youth to get jobs, or they just don't see it? Well, they see it, and I'm sure they would like to. But that's like asking why can't we employ everyone in this country, right? That's a very complicated answer. So they're trying, but that gets involved in politics and all sorts of things. It's not that any country likes unemployment. It's that sometimes it's really difficult to actually create jobs. We're reconciled to God by God himself uh, sacrificing himself on the cross and thereby reconciling our sin. I see no way of reconciling uh, sin in Islam. So this is, yeah, this is something that we, we talked about in the first session, that the way that we reconcile sin in Islam is by submitting to God. Because the main sins tend to be forgetting about God, not believing in God, or replacing God with, with something or someone else. So sin is reconciled by us submitting to God, and we pray for our sins to, to be forgiven. So one of the declarations when you go on the Hajj is that now your sins are forgiven. It's part of that, that reconciliation process that most uh, Muslims, when they go on the Hajj, they see it as a spiritual rebirth. So we have various mechanisms inside Islam uh, for sin to be forgiven, for reconciliation to happen, um, and it, a lot of it has to do with, with us, us submitting to God. I don't remember if I brought this up in the second session, and I know I meant to bring it up in the first session. Um, but now that I'm thinking about it, I think I did use this example in the second session. But it's worth saying again that most religions, they will say, when we're talking about this sin and salvation type idea, they will say that if you want to feel better, if you're sick and you want to feel better, you actually have to take the medicine. You can't just say, I believe the medicine will make me better, or I believe the doctor will heal me. You actually have to do something. You actually have to take the medicine. And so in Islam, you actually have to submit to God in order for your sins to be reconciled and forgiven. But again, those sins tend to be not submitting to God. So it's a natural, natural thing anyway. I'd like to ask a little bit about uh, the treatment of women, because that is always hit on. I and I believe it's more the culture in which they're growing. Um, coming from having a Muslim family, I know that the the girls in that area are very well educated and uh, not looked out on. They're they're part of the whole family. Yeah. So this isn't true that that's Muslim. <laughs> no, we see. So um, there are definitely issues with how women are treated. Um, some of it is in Islam. A lot of it is culture. Um, and it, it all comes down to how do we interpret the Quran. So there are things in the Quran. Or again, the Quran was written in the 7th century. So we have a 7th century code in there. But again, the Hebrew Bible was written before the turn of the era. And so as I mentioned last week, um, in the span of four verses in Deuteronomy 22, I'm commanded to stone women, or in the span of five verses, I'm commanded to stone women four times. But we don't see that being applied. So it's a lot of Muslims are, are struggling and working through how to interpret the Quran. Um, and this is, but this tends to be a cultural thing. And one of the best examples I should say for this is that uh, we look at countries like even Pakistan, uh, Indonesia, they've elected women as heads of state. Right? And those are our most populous Muslim countries. We haven't even done that in America. So we can't say that all Islam is against women or all Muslim countries are against women. Um, when we do see things, it tends to be cultural. 
Does that mean Islam is perfect for, for women? No. Is Christianity perfect for women? No. Is Judaism? No. This is, again, and I said this in the first week, this is a religion issue, not just a particular religious tradition issue, that women need to be, tra- be, need to be treated better across the world in all religions. really glad you brought that up because being female and having a daughter the way you see women treated is um, one of the probably the most challenging problems I have in accepting Islam. Um, with How do we as Americans respect women's or peop- the uh, cultural, okay, women's um, desire to wear the burqa mm-hmm. but yet um, link that with safety and security? Is a woman in a burqa I, you, I don't see how you can identify that person. And so I just, that's, that's one thing that bothers me. Yeah. Um, you, you actually reminded me to, to say something that I forgot to say earlier. So I thank you for that. So let me say what I'm going to say first so I don't forget it, and then I'll answer your question. Um, it goes along the same lines, though. One thing we didn't talk about is violence against Muslims in America. That Muslims have been the target of hate crimes tremendously across the country. Part of the um, backlash against Muslims have hit non-Muslims because Americans are too stupid to know who people are. So Sikhs are one of the big... um, Sikhism is the fifth largest religion in the world, and they tend to be uh, the recipients of a lot of anti-Muslim backlash because Americans don't know who's Sikh and who's Muslim. So the Oak Creek uh, Temple shooting in Wisconsin from 2000. 12, I believe, um, seems to be a a case of mistaken identity. And one reason why we see this is because most Americans, when they see the turban, they associate it with Islam. The turban is more of a Sikh item of clothing than it is a Muslim item of clothing. So when you see a turban in Oregon, it's most likely a Sikh, not a Muslim. Oregon has a really good Sikh population. Salem has a great Sikh population. I encourage you to go visit the Sikh temple in South Salem. They are more than welcome to to host you. Uh, They're wonderful. So we see then um, Americans being stupid about about what religion actually is. Turban tends to be Sikh, not Muslim. To answer your question, Stephanie, um, the problem with the question itself is that it automatically sees them as suspicious. We're operating then from from the groundwork of suspicion rather than acceptance. And part of it, I mean, like we can say, you know, how much of your face you show, face scanners, you know, big brother type stuff, but it's already starting from a place of suspicion rather than a place of acceptance. So, yeah, so she says when she goes to get her driver's license taken, uh, she has to show her face. Um, but also, thanks to the First Amendment of the Constitution, people are allowed to wear their religious clothing when receiving their government IDs. And I don't think that's necessarily something we want to change, because that takes us down a dangerous path. Um, because the free practice of religion allows Jews to wear a kippah in their driver's license photo. It's going to allow a Muslim woman to wear a hijab or a burqa. It will allow me to wear a cross around my neck if I want to when I'm taking a picture. So only banning one religion from being able to wear their religious garb is a very dangerous path to go down. We do, so she asked about the use of, of facial recognition and law enforcement in, in the country. We do use it, absolutely. Um, whether you want it to be used or not is probably a different conversation. Um, and... And beyond saying that it, it operates from a realm of suspicion rather than acceptance, I don't know how else to answer your question in a way that's going to like dive at what you want me to say. Um, because, again, I take very... Um, one thing I appreciate about being American is that people are allowed to practice their religion without suspicion, or at least they should be able to practice their religion without suspicion. And because in Christianity we don't tend to wear our religion this question doesn't, like, it seems to be an easy thing for us, right? Because we don't wear clothing necessarily that marks us as Christian. Other religions do, and it's a way that they're identifiable. It's a way that they tie into their faith. It's a way that they honor God. And so it's really hard then to tell them, don't do it because I'm scared of what you might do. 
instead of being suspicious, we should think about all the numbers that I flashed up here about how many Mo American Muslims don't support terrorism, how many American Muslims are finding their own way in America, creating their own religious tradition, seeing Sharia as a personal, not a public thing. That should be our driving consideration, not fear. So. Eight years ago, to me, Obama was a strange word. And I didn't think it was American. And I suspect many people still do. I don't know. Yeah, actually, actually, about the same amount of people today still don't think Obama's an American citizen as they did in 2009. Um, that even though the birth certificate has been produced, even though no other president in the history of this country has ever been asked to prove their, his citizenship, um, people still don't think Obama is a citizen. And that played a role in uh, him being accused of being Muslim. Because again, you're not going to accuse a Christian of being foreign, which is why we don't, I mean, like Donald Trump has kind of changed the game a little bit, uh, because he's accusing Ted Cruz of not being a citizen. But we don't tend to see Christians, like John McCain wasn't born in this country. Uh, he was born on, I think he was born on a, an army base, a military base overseas. But he wasn't born within the borders of America. Um, but no one questioned his citizenship. So not only do we have this identity marker of foreignness being attached to Obama, but we're going to put Muslim on top of it to not only enhance the foreignness, but to say that Islam is foreign to begin with. We need to start recognizing that Islam is just as American as any other religion. That Islam is not a foreign thing. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, yeah, Matt, um, after 911, um, I volunteered with Medical Teams International out of Portland and went to um, Masari Sharif, Afghanistan. I was there in March, spent the month there. Um, worked with a uh, female physician who, of course, did the GYN work, gynecology work, and two um, Afghani doctors. We went way back into the out country, uh, I mean way back into some very rural areas. I've never felt safer. Mm. Uh, but one of the things with uh, with Nadia, when I talked with her, because uh, you know the Taliban was now out of sight, they were basically gone. Why do you still wear the burqa? And she gave me an interesting answer. She said the reason I wear the burqa is for privacy. And she was a very beautiful woman, and there was a lot of you know staring that happened, and a lot of she was a woman, oftentimes among a great uh, mobs of men. And particularly when she was, uh, you know, in the small areas, she really wanted that uh, privacy. That, and I had, I came to a, a new understanding about the burqa and what, you know, for her, well, for Nadia, what, uh, what that meant. That's so. a, yeah, that's a great story. Um, in one of my classes, I show a video of a Muslim woman who converted. I don't know where she's from, Europe, someplace, um, but she converted to Islam. And she decided to wear the burqa after she converted. And her family wasn't Muslim. And they asked her, why would you do that? You're so beautiful. Like, you have beautiful hair. Why would you cover yourself up? And she says, first of all, this is my choice. This is my feminist act that I can wear what I want to and be okay. Not only that, but I get to control who sees me. That now I don't have to worry about guys staring at me and gawking at me on the streets because I can control who gets to see my body. It's a form of safety and security, but also choice. And she real, that was very strong for her uh, and something that she really appreciated. Um, the way you said that made me think of something else, but I can't remember what I was going to say. So I was gonna, I'll leave it at that. That's, that's a perfect story. Um, oh, the other thing I tend to show some of my classes is a political cartoon of um, a Muslim woman um, in, a, in a full burqa looking at a woman in a bikini walking by and saying, oh, look how oppressed she is. She's wearing what the man wants. And the woman in the bikini looking at the woman in the burqa saying the exact same thing. Oh, look how oppressed she is. She's wearing what the man wants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what, I, that's what I was wondering about, too, because um, I was over in Italy a couple summers ago, and there was a lady in a burqa, and her husband was just in jeans and a T-shirt and re looked really sloppy, and I just thought... What right does he have to dress like that? And she's all covered up. And it was very disturbing to me because I was thinking, because she, she looks so pretty underneath with what I could see of her face. And I just felt really badly for her because I just wanted to take her and say, you're too beautiful to be covered up. And your husband doesn't have the respect for you. He's just, you know, so I got that same feeling too. I felt like he was putting her down and making her cover up and hide her beauty. 
but why can't you be beautiful and covered up, right? We, I think we need to stop seeing the burqa or the hijab as being unbeautiful or saying that if, if a woman doesn't want to show something off, she doesn't have to show something off. If she wants to be covered from head to toe, why are we telling her she can't do that? Who, but whose benefit is that for? We might say it's for her benefit, but if we want to think that it's her benefit, why don't we ask her what she wants, right? That should be, that should be part of it. And we actually see... Um, we begin to see, um, I'm not a fashion person at all, but um, um, uh, one of the major fashion companies uh, is putting out a line of hijabs right now. Um, uh, if I try to say it, I'm going to butcher it, um, so I won't even sound foolish. But they're putting out a line of hijabs right now, um, and we see some uh, hijabs and burqas being um, displayed on fashion runways and fashion shows across the country now. It's starting to pick up a little bit uh, to change the fashion industry's mind about what the burqa and the hijab are. And I should say, in case you don't know, the hijab tends to be the headscarf. The burqa tends to be the full body thing. Um, for those of you who don't know, the, don't know the difference. Is there anything comparable in uh, American Islam to what happened in the Jewish community with branches? Uh, uh, an orthodox, a conservative, and a reform movement? Yeah, somewhat. Uh, not in the same way. Uh, and maybe that's because um, maybe that's because Islam in America is still fairly young, especially when we look at the third and fourth waves. Uh, they're still fairly young, so they're trying to get their feet underneath them. But what American Muslim leaders are saying is that we should look at what American Judaism did, and we should kind of model what they did. Um, the branches that we see in Judaism kind of happened post-Enlightenment and then became more reinforced as they immigrated to America in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So they're almost a century ahead. American Judaism is almost a century ahead of American Islam when we're talking about the Americanization process. Um, so we do see people looking, and that's why I said that 15% of American Muslims who say, I'm just Muslim, I'm not Sunni or Shia, we begin to see that group constructing their own branch of Islam. Uh, as I said before, we have the uh, Nation of Islam that was uh, started in America. This, the, um, the Moorish Temple was started in America. Ahmadiyya movement was not started in America. I think I said that the first session. I was wrong. It wasn't started in America, uh, but has a very strong American presence, uh, kind of taking on its own form. But, um, but it takes a little bit. It, it takes getting your feet underneath you uh, in order to take on a real American strand. Yeah. Matt, I'm wondering if the numbers that you shared with us in the first week about only a, only a um, minority of Muslims are Arab Muslims, and you and how many Muslims come from Indonesia, India, Pakistan, other parts of uh, Africa as well. Do you have any idea? what the percentage of American Muslims comes from Arab countries, Middle East, and what percentage of American Muslims come from, like you said, blacks being, um, or other countries? Yeah, I do have those numbers. If you remember from uh, the first week, I said 64% of Muslims uh, across the world are Asia Pacific Muslims. That's because Indonesia, Pakistan, India, um, Bangladesh, and Nigeria are the top five countries. Um, that said, American Muslim immigrants tend to be overwhelmingly Middle Eastern. Um, and so for, uh, if we look at the Middle East and North Africa combined, uh, then we see about 40% of American Muslims are coming from those regions. A smaller amount are coming from Indonesia uh, and the South Pacific. Um, so yeah, about 40% are coming from the Middle East. But again, remember, the Muslim population across the world, only about 20% of them live in the Middle East. So, so the, the, the American immigrant population is, is heavily Middle Eastern, not exclusively by any means, though. Earlier, you mentioned that Christians and Jews were, uh, op were not infidels because they had one God. Uh, how do the Muslims feel about Hindus and Sikhs and some of the others? Good question. Uh, and this is going to depend somewhat on where uh, we're talking about. But in places like India and Indonesia, where we have higher Hindu populations, a lot of Hindus are seen as people of the book. Uh, and so they're kind of counted in this, in this classification. They, uh, and that's because Hindus can be monotheistic. 
Hinduism is its own little thing. It's, it's a very complex religion. There's a, there's a whole lot to Hinduism. But Hindus can very easily be monotheistic. And so in, in places with high Hindu populations, we see that sort of acceptance. Again, though, if we look at North India, we have a whole lot of violence. Hindus killing Muslims, Muslims killing Hindus, Hindu monks leading the charge and actually fighting and, and killing people, civilians. Um, and so we see clashes, but by and large, Hindus are associated. Sikhism, um, that's a better question. Sikhs tend to be, um, and I'm speaking a little bit more historically than contemporary, um, because my knowledge of, of contemporary Sikh Muslim relations is not as good as my historic knowledge is. Um, but they weren't seen as, as accepted by historic uh, Islam or by Hinduism because they tried to kind of forge their own branch. Sikhism began uh, in the North India, South Pakistan area. So the area that Sikhism began was half Hindu, half Muslim. And so that Sikhism began by their leader, Guru Nanak, asking God, are you Hindu or are you Muslim? And God said, neither, I am one. And so Sikhism, affirm, Sikhism itself affirms that the same God is worshipped by all religions. Um, but because they don't have the same lineage, Sikhism began in the 1500s. So because they don't have the same lineage, some Muslims have a harder time accepting them as people of the book because they didn't come before Muhammad. Jews and Christians are easier to accept than Hindus because they all came before Muhammad. And so once we have someone coming after Muhammad, it kind of puts a question mark on Muhammad being the last prophet. So that's the best way I can do that. I can't speak to contemporary Sikh Muslim relations very strongly, though. Uh, in the 70s, uh, when during the Iranian uh, revolution, uh, I know a lot of Baha'is had to leave in uh, Iran mm -hmm. and the Middle East. And I'm wondering, uh, I know many of them went to England and to the Americas, uh, I'm wondering, do they are they getting any involved in any of this, or are they getting repercussions from it? There is some um, anti-Muslim violence being directed towards Baha'i because, again, people don't know. Um, but we also see Baha'i getting involved in some of these interfaith projects. So there's a what's it called? It's a coalition coalition for multi-faith democracy that's happening in, in New Jersey that has Quakers and Buddhists and Muslims. Uh, and I, I believe Baha'i are also involved in that process now. So we see Baha'i being involved in some of the interfaith stuff. Um, I don't know the anti-Muslim uh, violence being directed at Baha'i, uh, the numbers. The thing is, is um, the FBI has been really bad at tracking them because the FBI didn't really understand religious breakdown very well either. And so it's just in the past two years that the FBI has be, they've, they've lumped all like Baha'i, Sikh, Muslim violence as anti-Arab or anti-immigrant violence rather than as separate religious violence. And it's not until 2013, I believe, that, or 14, that the FBI announced that they'd be tracking those statistics separately, recognizing these different religious branches. So any of the numbers we have are very, very new, um, and I don't know them very well. You teach at Chemeketa. You teach kids much younger than this audience. <laughs> how, how are they perceiving the Muslim, Christian? How, how do you reach those kids? Yeah, let me, uh, let me tell this audience something about my generation. Um, <laughs> that my generation... Does, by and large, is not concerned about religious breakdown as much as your generation is. So the way that I hear my students talking about it is, as long as I can stay Christian, let them be Muslim. They don't care. And they also know that when they hear things on the news, they know something's messed up. They know something's awry. They know that just doesn't make sense in their head, that the world's second largest religion cannot be all bad. They know that that sounds wrong. They just don't know where to turn for the information. And so that's why I have a lot of them in my class. My summer, uh, I taught Middle Eastern religion, so Judaism, Islam, Christianity. I taught it in the fall. And probably a good half, if not two-thirds of my students, said, I'm taking this class just to learn about Islam. Because I'm really curious. I know what's out there isn't true, and I want to know what's true. So they don't see a, a, a clash. Um, they don't see a tension. They may, they don't, a lot of them don't believe in Islam. Uh, they're not planning on converting, but again, that's fine, right? I'm not trying to convert any of you to Islam either. They, 
they liked the idea of people being able to pursue religion according to their own needs and their own desires and what works for them. A lot of my students tend to see religions as learning styles. We all have different learning styles, and so a religion is going to speak to one person differently than speak to someone else just because we're all different. And that's... and. And this is me bragging on my students. My students are awesome in that way. We, there are hardliners uh, in, in multiple different arenas in my classes. But the young people, um, they, they want to learn. They don't see tension. And um, you know, they kind of want everyone to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. That's really, that's really what they want to do.